It is my absolute pleasure to bring in ESPN's Dan Shulman with us on TYT Sports. Dan, how are you today? I'm doing great, Rick. How about you? I'm doing absolutely great this morning. Uh, let me start off with this. I know that you've probably got this question a million times, but I have to ask. Researching your story, you went to the University of Western Ontario where you majored in actuarial science. Yeah. Where did you go about in getting into the broadcasting industry exactly? Well, when I was at college, I'm Canadian, born and raised, still live in Canada. When I was at college or university, as we say here, uh, just for an extracurricular something to do, uh, I went, actually I wanted to write in the Western Gazette, the, the uh, campus newspaper is a terrific paper, but the line was huge. This is Frosh Week, my first week there, and I guess my parents had kind of, you know, driven into me, you got to round out your resume, you got to do something. So uh, when the lineup for the newspaper was too long, I wandered into the office where the radio station was, there was nobody there, and I said, what do you guys do and do you need somebody to do sports? And that weekend I called a Western football game. Now this is, you know, the campus radio station then was much smaller, it's bigger now, but the college sports in Canada are not on the level obviously of college sports in the US. So it's not like I was doing Michigan football or Notre Dame football or something like that. But I started doing football and basketball games in my first week of first year and loved it and did it all through, uh, well, my first three years there actually, I, I stopped doing it in fourth year to concentrate on my studies. Uh, graduated as an actuary and um, then had a midlife crisis at 22, which I really recommend for people. If you have to have a midlife crisis, do it before you have a wife and kids and a mortgage. And I decided I didn't like being an actuary and I wanted to give broadcasting a try and uh, it's worked out. Clearly, it's worked out. Um, <laughs> I understand your big break was with the fan 1430 and TSN. How did you go about pursuing those and in the end landing those jobs? Well, when I was uh, when I decided that I wanted to get into broadcasting, I got a job with a small station uh, called CKBB in a city uh, called Barrie, Ontario, about 50 miles north of Toronto. And actually, for about six months, I was an actuary Monday to Friday and a newscaster Saturday Sunday, which I, I doubt any other human being has ever been or will ever be again. And I was driving the 50 miles back and forth doing the newscast and all that. But I wanted to get to Toronto and I wanted to do sports. And there was a station then called CJCL, which as you mentioned, uh, later on became the fan that was becoming all sports. And I had a friend of a friend of a friend who worked there and I sent in a tape and they worked with me. And after a few months, they hired me part-time and eventually full-time. And I started doing sports casts and a talk show. And these were good times. These were the early 90s. The Maple Leafs were in the semifinals both years. The Blue Jays won the World Series in 92 and 93. So, you know, it, it was a great time to be in sports. And uh, a couple years later, 95, the Blue Jays broadcaster on TSN uh, decided that he was going to move back to Vancouver and just concentrate on hockey. Jim Houston is his name. And that was my biggest break. Um, why they wanted me, I don't know. I auditioned, actually didn't get the job. Three months later, they called me back and brought me in again. Huh. And I got the job. I was only 28 years old then and started doing Major League Baseball. And that was, that was the biggest break I ever got. Well, let's talk about a baseball game you broadcasted. I think we can both agree that the events that take place during a game make broadcasters and the way that you call it. You were working the Phillies-Mets game on Sunday Night Baseball. Your call that night when Osama bin Laden was killed reminds many of the time Howard Cosell in 1980 on a Monday Night Football game called the uh, Dolphins and Patriots game and the news of John Lennon getting shot and killed outside of his apartment. You guys have drawn many comparisons. What was going through your mind when you heard that and how did you go about broadcasting it to the masses on Sunday Night Baseball? Well, it's funny. I, I understand the comparison with Howard Cosell because, you know, when John Lennon was killed, um, I, I don't know if you could have two people who uh, are more different than myself and Howard Cosell was. And, and you know, I mean, Howard, he, he you know, he's going to, he, he was phenomenal. He was extraordinary and, and gave his opinion and, and just, I, I was much more low key about it. I, I, I was, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I didn't know what to do. I was nervous. It, it started when Bobby Valentine, who was sitting beside me in the booth, nudged me with his elbow and just showed me his phone. And there was a text on it. I, I, don't, I didn't look to see who it was from. I don't know. And all it said is, uh, it said something like, you know, Bin Laden is dead or something like that. So I immediately go on TalkBack, which for people who don't know is an ability, you know, a button I can push so I can talk to the people in our truck without people on the air hearing, uh, people at home hearing it. And I said, what do you got? And they said, we just heard it too. Just keep doing the game. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. you just keep doing the game. We weren't in a commercial. Obviously this is on my mind and I realize I'm going to have to say something about this pretty soon. I don't know if it's true. I don't know the circumstances, the details. I don't know anything. So they just kept saying, 
We're getting some details. We'll help you out. Just keep doing the game. It's too early to say anything. We got to corroborate some details, which I'm glad they did because, yeah, boy, you don't want. It's okay to be wrong about a pitch count. You don't want to be wrong about something like that. <laughs> yeah. And eventually, uh, they came back to me and said, "Okay, here's what we know. The president is going to speak at." Just advise people for more details to tune over to their ABC news station because ABC and ESPN were all in the same corporate family, and then get back to doing the game. And it, it, it was tricky. I, I'm, I'm not trained for this. I'm not a news guy. I'm a, I, I'm a sports guy, and that was a, a, a nerve-wracking moment. You know, we also were in Philadelphia with 45,000 people, many of whom were New Yorkers because the Mets were the opposition. And I also, and maybe I shouldn't be, but I'm also very always mindful of the fact I, I'm not American. I mean, 9-11 affected me tremendously, as it did you and everybody else, but I, I'm not American, and I want to make especially sure that my words are chosen carefully. So that was a, that was a pretty nerve-wracking few minutes for me. Now, getting back to... Uh the, the broadcasting side per se, you have had so many incredible finishes in your career that you have had the good fortune to call home runs and buzzer beaters. How exactly do you not get too into the moment and let it play out, but also produce a great finishing call? You know, it's funny because sometimes you'll have a big moment and you'll hear the call back the next day on radio or TV, depending on, on what you're working on. And you'll say, boy, I, I, I thought I sounded different than that. I, was, I, I didn't sound as excited as I felt. Or, you know, you're competing with the crowd and everything. And, and sometimes the best thing you can say is nothing at all or very little, uh, ironically. But I, I've had two very recently in the last couple of months. The World Series, and this is the first World Series I got a chance to call, doing it for ESPN Radio in Game 6. You know, twice the Rangers are a strike away from winning and, and the Cardinals come back and win. And then uh, just doing a game last week, actually, uh, at, at your alma mater at Indiana, when they took down number one Kentucky on a three-pointer with a buzzer. Those are two of the most exciting games I've ever been at in my life. And, and I don't have a scripted call for a home run or a three-pointer or a game winner. I say what I feel. I never, I've never once in my life written anything out in advance and said, if this happens, I'm going to say this. It's just not who I am. And... I, I try, if I get caught up in the moment, I get caught up in the moment. I, 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 the, the fan in me still lives. I, I'm still the same guy who, when he was a little kid, just wanted to watch the game and, and find out who wins. And, and that's, that's how I feel when I'm sitting courtside or sitting in a baseball stadium watching a game. I, I, I don't plan it out. What, what comes out comes out, and, and you know, hopefully it works more often than not. Now, growing up, did you model yourself after someone, or did you love watching one certain broadcaster? Well, being from Toronto and being a huge baseball fan, uh, the late Tom Cheek, who uh, should be in the Hall of Fame and hopefully will be soon, he, he broadcast for the Jays from their inception for about 27 years with, and never missed a game until he became ill and eventually passed away. He was the closest thing I had. And when I you know, grew up and got a chance to work with him and meet him, that was pretty special for me. Other than that, it, it's, it's the classic guys. It's Vin Scully, a uh, huge Jack Buck fan, Harry Callis in baseball, you know, Bob Costas, Al Michaels, kind of the, you know, the, the Mount Rushmore of play-by-play uh, of -play guys. They, um, I like the guys. For, first and foremost, I've got to keep you informed. I've got to tell you what's going on. I've got to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. I'm not a comedian. I don't try to be one. You know, we, we, we try to have some fun, but I'm not going to be out there doing stand-up during a game. And, and what I liked about Al Michaels and Vin Scully and these guys is they just, you know, they, they just came across beautifully. The things they said were the things that you, you said to yourself, man, I wish I'd thought of that. And, and they, they knew what they were talking about, and they made the game interesting. They, they, they gave me a reason to watch the game, whatever the game was. And that's, uh, those are the guys I, I really admired the most. You talked about the Mount Rushmore of sports broadcasters that you really like. Is there, sir, is there one other one uh, that you are really into and really like hearing right now in 2011? Uh, boy, that's a tough one. I, I mean, I think at, at, at ESPN, I think we have so many talented people. And, you know, I, I love watching Mike Breen do an NBA game. I love watching Sean McDonough do anything. I think Sean McDonough, and I've heard him do football, baseball, basketball, hockey, golf. I've heard him do all of those, and he does all of those brilliantly. I think he's as well-rounded uh, and talented a play-by-play -play guy uh, as there is in the business. Obviously, Joe Buck has tremendous ability. So, um, you know, I hate throwing names out there because inevitably I'm forgetting somebody. But when I watch games, I I'm not just uh, watching them to see the teams because I've got those teams coming up. I'm learning from broadcasters, and they, and they, they could be local guys, national guys, radio, TV, older, younger, doesn't matter. It, it, uh, I, I still believe I'm learning every day, and I try to pick things up from other people in the business. You are currently the number one college basketball broadcaster for ESPN. 
That has to feel good. Um, do you, what, what is your take on the one and done rule exactly in college basketball? I can't stand it. I, I think it's bad for everybody. Um, I think it's bad for colleges because you don't know if you need to recruit and the kids don't necessarily need to go to school in second semester if they know they're coming out. I think it's bad for fans. You know, you get a great player like a Kyrie Irving and, and then you lose him after a year. There, there's, there's no chance for that continuity um, that college basketball fans, had, you know, used to really enjoy. I mean, guys like Ralph Sampson and Patrick Ewing and Akeem Olajuwon, they stayed yeah. four years. Those guys are, you know, are, are one and done this year. I think it's bad for the NBA because I think the a lot of the, a lot of times the players are coming out as unfinished products and and um, immature in certain ways about life, and it's and, and they're just not prepared for the NBA. I, I believe basketball should adopt the baseball rule. I don't think anybody should have to go to college. It's not for everybody. And you're 18 years old. If you're old enough to serve in your country's military, you should be old enough to go play professional basketball and earn a living. But if you do choose to go to college, I think there should be a minimum of two, and, and I would say even three, but I would settle for two years where you go. I, I think everybody would benefit, the players, the NBA, the NCAA, and most of all, us, the fans. Let me ask you on a, uh, on a total serious note, how did it feel to be tackled by Kyle Singler at the ACC tournament? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I used to play a lot of basketball, not not very well, but I used to play a lot. It's still the only charge I've ever taken in my life. <laughs> it, um, it was uh, uh, two years ago, I guess, in Greensboro. Long shot, the rebound was bouncing toward us, and here comes Singler. And, you know, there was that moment in time, you know, like in the old days when you could actually lock your keys in the car, when you realized you were doing it, but there was nothing that could be done to stop it. It was a slow motion moment, but it was it was happening. And, and I could see him flying and there was nothing I can do. And, and I'm not a small person, but he's 6'8", 230, whatever he is. And he literally flew over the table. It's, it, it, it actually got me some YouTube play for a while. It's as it famous did. or infamous as it's ever been. Yeah, He flew over the table and landed right on me and, and broke the chair, crushed me. And the chair and me and Singler all went down to the ground, <laughs> took out the TV monitor, the headsets, my drink, my notebooks, every, everything that, that was on the desk. The incredible part was he saved the ball. And the game kept going. The game never stopped. He's lying on top of me. We're both down on the floor. Um, I'm a mess. I can't see anything. Vital's beside me trying to do play-by-play, -play, which was uh, interesting in its own right. Uh, and the game went on. And it was, uh, it was just one of those things where I was in the wrong place, I guess, at the right time. I wasn't hurt. He wasn't hurt. We, did, we just kind of went on and got back to our business about, you know, in the next few seconds. But uh, it, was, uh, it was something. I, I still get asked about it as much as anything else. I got two more questions for you, Dan. I know that a lot of people who are going to be leaving comments in our clip right now watching this interview are going to be really interested to see why you have a Green Bay Packers uh, flag back there. Can you describe that? Other shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was a big San Diego Chargers fan back in the day, Air Coriel, back when I was that impressionable boy of 12, 13, 14, whatever it was. And my favorite player on the, on the Chargers was John Jefferson and a receiver. Uh, number 83, I think, if, if memory serves. And he was traded to the Green Bay Packers. And I guess I liked him more than I liked the team because I was the fan to be named later. I got thrown into the deal and my allegiance went to the Packers. And, and I'm no bandwagon guy. I, I lived through a lot of four and 12 seasons. Um, you know, Lynn Dickey and Eddie Lee Ivory and Don Majkowski. There were some decent teams, but there were some bad Packer teams as well. Um, so I, I've been a fan for a long time. You know, had a, obviously a great run in the Brett Favre era, won a, a Super Bowl. Packers won a Super Bowl then. They won it last year, and now, uh, as we speak, 13-0 and on the season this year. And I actually took my youngest son, my 11-year-old, who's a sports freak. You'll be interviewing him someday. And uh, we went to Lambeau two weeks ago, which was one of the great days I've ever had. I, I just, uh, you know, I live in Toronto. I'm more of an NFL fan than a CFL fan, and football is not a sport I cover. So I feel like I have free reign to root for any team I want to, and uh, the Packers are big in this house. You think they'll go undefeated? I do. I think the tough one uh, was the uh, was the the short turnaround they had for the Thanksgiving Day against the Lions, and then the game at the Giants. And they they're banged up. They've got a lot of injuries, but. Uh, they play the Chiefs on the road, and then they're home to Detroit and Chicago, I think. And unless they decide they're going to rest Aaron Rodgers and not play him at all in the final week to save him for the playoffs, then I think they're going to go 16-0. This is my last question for you, Dan. What advice could you give to young broadcasters out there, including myself? Would it be networking? Would it be staying in touch with contacts? What would be your one piece of advice? Work your tail off. Uh, there are so many people who want to get into the business because it's, you know, quote unquote, cool or glamorous or, or whatever it is. You, you've got to separate yourself from the herd. 
Uh, I'm a big I'm a big networking guy, and I'm a big face-to-face -face guy. I remember when I was applying for radio jobs when I was 22 years old, I was driving all around the province of Ontario, just saying, I know you don't have an opening, can I just come in and meet you and, and learn a little bit about the business? And maybe you make an impression on somebody when you're face-to-face -face that an email or a DVD or something like that isn't going to do. So I, I really believe in, in, in the personal contact. But more than anything, I, I'm a prepaholic. The only thing you can control is your own preparation. I think you got to work your tail off. Uh, because so many people want to do it. They're, uh, that's the only way I know how to, to kind of separate myself. And, and uh, it, it's hard. It, it's, it's, there are, for, for every good job there is in our industry, there are a ton of them where you're working crazy hours and not making much money and you're away from home and you miss your family. And I, and, you know, I, I have the travel and the miss my family stuff too. But, but uh, just you know, work harder than the next guy and, and hope for the best. Dan Schulman of ESPN, thank you so, so much for the time. Will you promise me that you will come back on the show? Yes, sir, I will. I, I got Indiana this weekend, so watch for that. It, it, when the, after the Packers win the Super Bowl, give me a call and I'll come back on. All right, absolutely. Thank you so much, Dan. Really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Rick.